So very big welcome to everybody. We are now in the environment, food and climate room, and we're going to be hearing from Scott Billy and Mira Rubin from Sustainability Now on the circular economy an essential key to reversing climate change. Thank you so much. Over to you, Scott. Thanks, Priya. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Scott, one of the co-founders of Sustainability Now, and my co-founder co uh, Mira is here with us as well. And today we're going to be talking about the circular economy and what we can do to uh, shape a new economy. Our general motto is um, sustainability now. We want to uh, focus on technologies and paradigms that shape a world that works. So what we want to address is the current model of how we're consuming natural resources and what we can do to uh, turn that around and make it much more sustainable in the future. And before we get started, I'm, I want to introduce our special guest who's here with us from Australia, and that is Sean Steed. And uh, Sean has a company called Change Climate, which is a really wonderful example of circular economy in action. So uh, we have a little bit of a slideshow to begin to kick this off. And then as we move through that, then Sean will engage you, but why don't you just at least say hello so people get to see you. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, good morning from uh, Australia. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's what is it? Five thirty in the morning. Five o'clock in the morning. Yeah, five thirty. Yeah. So we really appreciate you being here, Sean. All I right, back to you, Scott. Okay. Absolutely. And if anybody has any uh, questions or comments as we're moving along, I invite you to put them into the chat. Um, we'd like to get through the presentation in time to save some time at the end for. Uh, a little bit of a question and answer. So let's um, move along here into the presentation. So we wanted to talk about uh, the this current situation of the way we're manufacturing things around the world, um, lay out the problem, what we can do to solve that, and then Sean has a great example of what he's doing specifically to address these issues. Scott, we're see all we see is the problems on the left and. Oh, okay. I see the first thing. The linear. Okay, doke. Well, you know what? How about can we talk about just a general definition of what circular economy is, just to create a context? Yeah. The um the idea was that I was going to go through the way we are now, and then talk about how circular is different than that. Okay. But, um, the the main point is right now we've got this linear economy, the opposite of a circular economy, where we take resources out of the ground whether they're petroleum products, um, metal, metals, other minerals, we make things out of them and then we throw them away and they go into a pile or into a trash incinerator and to be burned and never used again. And that is just totally unsustainable. So the idea of a circular economy is rather than that straight one end to the other, cradle to grave as they call it sometimes, thinking about it more cradle to cradle. What can we do with these things when their useful life is um, used up, can we make something else out of them or turn them back into the same thing again in a full closed loop recycling model? And thus the idea of uh, circular. So one of the other problems that we have faced with here, and it's like the idea that more is better. You know, if, if your quarterly earning statement as a corporation doesn't have a 30% um, profit uh, increase over the last quarter, you're failing. Um, if as a consumer, you know, you need to buy more things to make yourself happy, this idea that getting more things is going to make things better is part of the problem and is sort of contributing to the, the current situation that we're in right now. And on top of that, we've got a concept called planned obsolescence where things are designed to break so that you can't use them forever. And when they do break, they're designed so that they can't be repaired and forcing you to buy a new one, which contributes to the, this whole cycle that we're in right now. Uh, fashion trends are another example. You know. Last year we had uh, chunky heels and this year we have thin heels and if you're wearing the wrong kind, uh, you don't fit in anymore. So, you know, it's how do we turn these things around? And another thing that's contributing to our problems is the idea that the gross domestic product and the stock market are real indicators of economic health. Uh, here in the US right now, we've got a stock market that's doing better than ever and the unemployment rate is higher than ever. Uh, those two things generally shouldn't go hand in hand. So there's something wrong with that equation that um, the way we're using to measure success right now. And 
ultimately it all comes down to the fact that you can't continue to run a throwaway society on a finite planet. We've only got so many resources, we can't continue to keep using them up and burning them and expecting to keep on this exponential growth pattern forever. So now what are we gonna do about it? We need a paradigm shift. How can we address these issues and what can we do to change it? And this is the idea of the circular economy. And when I was younger, we were taught, you know, the three R's, reduce, reuse, and recycle. And it seemed nice and simple and straightforward. And it's, you know, as we dig into that and peel away the layers a little bit more, we realize there's a, a lot to, more to it than that. So we want to sort of talk through the different uh, steps of really making change happen. And it turns out, instead of three R's, we wound up with 10 of them. <laughs> uh, even though I said uh, more isn't better, we, uh, we decided 10 was more, better than three. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if the first step is rethink, you know, and as we start to talk about these things, there are different ways that we can engage with them depending on where we are in our, you know, personal um, commitment to these things and also our situations, you know, are we thinking about this on a personal level, on our family level, what can we do around the house with, with our immediate families, on a community level, what can we do, you know, in, in the town or city that we live in to make change? and then on a global policy change kind of level. So all of these things that we're gonna talk about, they really impact any one of those stages and it depends on your level of commitment and um, access to those different uh, phases that I just described, where you should think about these things and, and how you can get involved with them. And before you move on, I really wanna talk about how rethinking is going to really require us to reassess our values. Mm -hmm. and and to expose things that have been probably invisible because they've been so integrated into our culture so um the the idea of uh money actually being a foundational driver for pretty much everything rather than looking or commodification of life uh, whether it is animals that we're slaughtering for uh, food or uh, commodification of our other natural resources, commodification of human beings to say that certain people are um, expendable versus others based on income. So rethink goes not just to a production cycle, but it goes very, very deep into the, um, the paradigm and the values that, have, uh, that are at the very heart of our societies. And um, in order to move forward, we need to start putting a value on our natural resources as natural capital that can't be renewed necessarily, or that we can use in a much more efficient way and uh, driving that from from a new foundation of thought so yep. and that that rethink you know to take it to the different levels it could be just rethinking your personal approach to do i need to buy more things to be happy or um do, do i need to replace this thing just because it was last year's color or you know whatever it happens to be on the personal level but through the production level, rethinking the way that we approach making things and on a um, you know, municipal or a um, countrywide governmental level, rethinking our policies that really push um, how things are, are measured and, and made. I just, was just looking at the um, budget for the little borough that I live in right now and about three quarters of the total annual budget is going into um, waste and uh, disposal of uh, garbage. So that's, I'm sorry, go ahead. That's, that's unsustainable and a ridiculous waste of our money to be spending three quarters of our local taxes on throwing things away. And actually to further that point, the notion uh, that there is such a thing as waste, that's mm -hmm. really what circular economy is challenging in the first place is um, circular economy is kind of modeled on nature and in nature there is no waste. Everything has its purpose. And what we need to be looking at is uh, this whole perception that waste that w waste exists and that it's okay 
uh, what we need to do is we need to create cycles and uh, processes that consume and reuse, as, as uh, Scott said, from cradle to cradle rather than cradle to grave kind of thing. Right. We need to stop thinking about things when we're tired of having them in our possession as waste that should be thrown out and think of them as the resources that they still are and what can happen to them. Exactly. Which kind of takes us into the next stage, which is redesign. And it's redesigning the structure of, of how we uh, make things, uh, making sure that there is a, a, a plan for it when the original use is, is done. How do we design a process that uh, uses less natural resources to begin with, and then also finds a way to um, make sure that that product, when it's reached its end of intended life, it gets turned into something else. And we can take this beyond redesign into processes, even in our own lives. So for example, lots of us use paper towels. Well, if we really sit back and rethink that, uh, taking a look at, does it make sense to cut down trees so that we can mop up a spill on the counter? Uh, so we want to be redesigning the way that we operate in our own lives to be more, more conscious, really, to not make the assumptions. I mean, the fact that we cut down trees to make toilet paper to wipe ourselves, you know, we could be using something like bamboo or hemp to um, that to create products that are are used with regularity you know and there's really no reason at all for instance to be using paper towels very much you know if we use rags or we we rewash and reuse things so we get to redesign our our daily living practices as well and if you take it up to the industrial level, redesigning the processes where you don't assume that there is waste inherent in your production process uh, and design it, it, design the waste right out of the process. So it's, you know, using up things, coming up with a, a more efficient way of cutting your raw materials so that you don't have trimmings and other waste and making sure that what the, the, when you do have trimmings that they get turned into something instead of just uh, going in a dumpster. Yeah, and, and for instance, the way that we use water in industrial practices, the water gets polluted, it goes into runoff, it pollutes the groundwater, and on and on and on, where we could be redesigning our processes in such a way that either we don't need to use water at all, or we can use much less water, or when we do use the water, there's a cycle that cl clear, cleans it and, and brings it back through the process. So it's a reconceptualization, really, that we're looking to do to, um, to make our resources last longer and, and be more efficiently used. Yep, and that you actually just segued straight into reuse, which is, um, you know, that is exactly what we're trying to do. If you can reuse something, it's way more efficient than recycling it, where you've got to destroy it down to raw materials again and make something new out of it. If we, the, the idea of reuse is ultimately the most sustainable of all, keeping things in their original purpose or reusing them for a different purpose without having to do anything to, um, to knock it down to base materials and, and actually producing something else out of it. So a really good example of reuse is the way we all used to get milk. You know, you'd get bottled milk, it was delivered and you'd take, use the milk and then the bottles would go back and get recollected and refilled. And uh, that way there's the cost and of transportation and of sterilization. However, th that is far less an expenditure of energy and resources than trying to recycle and remanufacture and then go back into the cycle, for example. Yep. And there's a great example, um, an effort called Loop that was founded by TerraCycle to get some of the major manufacturers uh, in the world to start producing their products and putting them in stainless steel containers that can be reduced, re reused and um, you know, keep kept in rotation rather than smashing them and making another can or bottle out of them. In fact, we did an interview with a woman named Elisa Shagorotsky, who is a zero waste expert. and. Uh, you can find our interviews at sustainabilitynow.global if you want to check them out also on, um, on iTunes, et cetera. But 
Uh, she was in the process of instituting or helping to institute a uh, returnable uh, packaging at our co-op. So the, you would pay extra for a deposit on the packaging for your prepared food, for example. You would bring that package back. And what happens here, which is pretty cool, is that it's eliminating thousands and thousands of plastic containers that were consumed through the co-op. It's creating new jobs because it's it, there are people that were, are, need to come and collect the containers. They need to be sterilized. And there's a whole process there. And it's obviously a more sustainable practice. So there are models to be able to institute this kind of reuse program uh, at all levels. Yep. And then, um, you know, next up we have reduce. Um, you definitely, it goes without uh, saying that if you can use less resources, you've got less to deal with in the long run. And um, it's a much easier process to try to make sure that it all stays in production. And that goes back to the paper towel example for, uh, for one. And another thing, you know, there are, there are things that we can reduce, for instance, uh, dryer sheets. You know, I don't, I don't know people who use dryer sheets. They're filled with chemicals and, and they're throwaways. So if we start looking at the things that we just throw away, uh, the packaged things that we buy that we could buy or buy or produce, um, we could buy in bulk or produce for ourselves, we're reducing our overall footprint, reducing uh, short trips in the car to make one longer expedition instead of lots and lots of uh, individual short trips, for instance, or there, there's a multitude of levels that we can personally reduce and that we can support our organizations to reduce as well. Yep. I see Arahat has um, asked in the chat, uh, can we repeat the name of the zero waste expert? Her, yes, thank you, Arahat. Her, and I hope we're saying your name right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Her name is Elisa Shagorodsky. And if you go to our website at sustainabilitynow.global instead of .com, you'll be able to find the interview with her. And I'm sure I, I, I don't remember. Is I'm what's sorry. killing the urban metabolism. Okay. So if you look for that, um, you'll find her contact information on that uh, the show notes page for that interview. Yeah, she's she's very well steeped in in this industry. And the thing is that so many of us believe that recycling is the answer. And I know I'm jumping the gun a little bit, Scott, but we'll, we'll get back to it. But the truth is, it is not the answer. In a way, it's one of the biggest frauds that's been perpetrated <laughs> on all of us to believe that we can have, you know, we, we clear our conscience by separating things and putting them in the recycle bin, but really the answer is reducing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, next up, we have rehome, which is um, a, a cool new term that uh, just came up. The idea of if you're done with something, that doesn't mean it's useless now. Uh, somebody else can use it, whether you donate it or put it in a yard sale. I personally, um, whenever anybody asks me what I would like for a, a present for any holiday or birthday, I say something from the thrift store because <laughs> I just can't uh, stand buying new things anymore. And I feel like I've got too much stuff to begin with. But the idea that um, you know we can keep these things moving. There's a, a, a local Facebook group that I belong to called the Resource Exchange here in Collingswood in New Jersey, where if you've got something and you're done with it, you just pop it up on the Resource Exchange and see if anybody locally wants it. Uh, you just pass it on to, to the next owner, or you know, worst case scenario, you donate it or um, put it, you know, have a yard sale and, and make a uh, quarter or something for it. And you know, uh, this goes back to the rethink piece, but we get to make uh, reusing things sexy <laughs> again, <laughs> instead, of, instead of making the newest, biggest, best thing sexy, let's, let's make, well, I have a phone that's 10 years old, let's make that sexy, <laughs> you know? Um, my phone's not 10 years old yet, but as an example, you know, like I, I love thrift store, 
uh, clothes because they're unique and different. And um, I, I think that what we need to do is to elevate the things that are really important and, and shift our values so that uh, people have a sense of, of accomplishment with, with conserving rather than consuming. Slow, and Arahat says, uh, you, uh, slow fashion too. Exactly, slow fashion. Yep. Something's not uh, useless just because uh, a new color came out this year. <laughs> exactly. Next up, we have repurpose, which not to be confused with upcycling, it's actually just making something else out of this thing without having to do anything to um, you know, break it down. Upcycling often refers to all these plastic bottles pictured on the wall here would be melted down and turned into a park bench or something. We don't, like we don't see any pictures. We just see the word. It must be too dark. Um, yeah. 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 I can't fix that on the fly here. But That's basically okay. the picture is a bunch of um, soda bottles that have been uh, mounted on a wall and there are, uh, are plants growing out of them. So they've, they've been turned into planters um, without any real heavy industrial uh, effort uh, applied to them. And then uh, I wanna keep it moving here so we don't get too bogged down and save, save some time for Sean's presentation. Uh, repair, you know, obviously if you've got something and it's broken or torn, um, that's the, the best way to be sustainable is to make sure you get the most use out of something before you decide that it's officially done. Um, my favorite example of that is I have a pair of uh, jeans that I got from a thrift store 25 years ago and uh, has been, been sewn up a few times, but they're still kicking. So that's uh, my we, effort to make uh, old used stuff sexy. We used, to, we used to darn socks when they had a hole in them instead of throwing them away. And, you know, maybe we can return to that. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, now that we're at step eight, we can talk about recycling because it does have a place. Um, True recycling. Uh, Mira talked a little bit about the fraud of recycling. It's usually mostly in the plastics arena. Um, you know, the plastics industry worked really hard to set up uh, recycling programs so that um, they could say, look, our products are recyclable. But if you look at the story of plastic and some of the other documentaries that have been done on it, what that really was was a great PR effort to, um, to kick the can down the road, no pun intended, but um, to, to make make people feel like it's no big deal. We can keep using this stuff all the time and uh, keep tossing it in the blue bin so that it gets recycled. But if you follow the path of those plastics, you know, they used to all go to China, China closed their, um, their borders and they're not taking those plastics anymore. Now they're winding up in some of the other Asian countries where they pull the one, you know, a couple of um, plastics have a little bit of value to them, like the number one PET, and they pull that out and the rest of it gets burned either in a field somewhere or as a, a fuel source, a really bad polluting inefficient fuel source for some um, low income uh, manufacturing processes. And so Tara is saying recycling is a false narrative. It absolutely mm -hmm. is. And what we want to be moving toward is zero waste. Yep. And even for, I think it's working, like the idea think, of smashing a glass bottle back into sand and then remelting it to make another glass bottle out of it is very energy inefficient. Exactly. Uh, aluminum cans and things like that. Exactly. And I think it's something like 9% of all plastics get recycled. 9%. And they stay here for hundreds, if not longer, uh, hundreds of years, if not longer. Right. And the ones that get recycled more than once is almost, it's like 1% or 2% total, which... When you talk about recycling, you know, melting down a plastic bottle and making a bench out of it isn't recycling. It's, it's repurposing and upcycling it, but it um, hasn't solved the problem where tomorrow's bottles are going to come from. Exactly. So next up we have rot. It's a little bit of a stretch to get uh, into the R's, but it's uh, super important, <laughs> composting your, your, uh, your plant matter. But that stuff does not belong in your trash can or in your, uh, your municipal waste stream. There's no reason to be paying somebody to haul it away and stick it in a landfill that's designed to keep things from decomposing because that creates the methane gas and other things. Get that stuff out of there and into a, a compost facility in your own yard or in a um, in municipal compost or whatever you have to do. Turn it back into soil. And one of the big problems we have right now is soil that's been you know used up in a lot of um, the industrial agricultural systems 
to where it's just one step above sand with chemicals sprayed on it to keep plants growing. Uh, it leads to a lot of erosion, kills the microbiome. It's just a, a bad practice, but using the organic matter to make new soil out of it, let nature do its job and uh, turn the stuff back into nutrients. That's where we really want to be. And then last but not least, the 10th R is refuse. If it doesn't fit into one of those things in front of that we just went through, just refuse it outright because there's no reason we have to buy something just because uh, a commercial on TV told us that it was important. So some good things to refuse, for instance, are a lot of fast foods that we buy frozen, you know, that are packaged in plastic and that plastic is not recyclable and uh, the quality of the food probably isn't so great either. And when we heat it up in its plastic container, we get toxins in our food. So there are lots of reasons, for instance, to go back to basics. And I think through COVID, one of the blessings of COVID is that so many of us began doing more cooking at home and realizing that this whole convenience mentality has impacted our health and our well-being, not to mention our environment. And Tara says, if everyone sent a single-use plastic item to the manufacturers and producers by uh, USPS with a note telling them to fix the problem instead of us individuals and communities to solve an unsolvable problem. I love that idea. Maybe we could start a campaign where we do that. Yeah, there was actually one, I forget what country it was in. I'm thinking maybe in the UK or somewhere where they were sending back the, um, the crisp packets. I'll, I'll say it that way. The we would call them potato chips. Um, but they're, they come in unrecyclable packaging. So they were packing it all into, um, into the mail and sending them back to the manufacturer saying, you guys figure out what to do with this stuff. I think that's brilliant. If yeah. we did enough of that, and maybe there's more of, a, of an opening for people to be engaged in that kind of action now. Um, June says, baking bread is the latest fad. People are learning to cook and sew again. One of the benefits of stay at home. That's absolutely true. I heard that there was a run on yeast and flour and that the shortages, which I think is fabulous to, you know, to, for what it's indicating. And not only are people sewing and baking, but they're also gardening yep. and they're, they're growing their own food more and more. And this is so important because we've really recognized the, um, the, the danger of the way our economy is built and the importance of localization. Absolutely, we can't rely on things being shipped around the globe. Uh, when when borders get shut down, uh, the supply chain stops. So, and nothing's more sustainable than growing food in your own yard. Exactly. Or in your community, if you've got a uh, an apartment, to get involved in a community garden or something, so that you've got a local source for food. And actually, something that I, I'm in an apartment. I don't uh, I don't have um, an engagement with a community garden right now, but. I started growing microgreens and they're really easy and really helpful. And it's inspiring to see those little things pop up through <laughs> the soil. And, and um, it's, it's just really exciting. Tara said my 30th, 30 ish daughter got into it all, or um, as far as gardens, we can buy from CSAs for lazy people. <laughs> she says <laughs> like her. But a CSA is a great opportunity to support your local agriculture um, and also to eat really well. And farmers markets, obviously. I'll give a little shameless plug for an upcoming interview that we've got coming up for. Uh, there's an organization in Pennsylvania called All Together Now PA, and their whole um, model is to create local supply chains where industrial hemp and food are grown, um, you know, within a hundred miles of where they will be turned into something and ultimately consumed. And that's it, spearheaded by Judy Wicks. You may be familiar with her, um, but she's, she's a Philadelphia based uh, one woman revolution kind of, who has sort of uh, spearheaded a national movement or a number of them, but mm -hmm. she's been into localization for a long time. And this is her latest yeah, and the model that they're developing there, the idea is that it's something that's going to be repeatable in uh, communities all over the world. And uh, they're really onto something big. I've been involved in some of their meetings and it's, it's impressive the, the scope of the people that are involved in it. And uh, Ray Kowalchuk, I don't know if I'm saying your name right, Ray, I apologize. 
he says, which R is refraining from supporting ocean fishing whose discarded nylon nets contribute 46% of ocean plastic? Wow, I never heard that statistic yeah, before, me. Ray. That's intense. So that's, that's a good idea to, uh, maybe we need 11, Scott. I'm gonna file that one right here under refuse. Okay. Refuse yeah. it. <laughs> that works, that works. Yep. Refrain and refuse, I guess, are two flavors of the same word. Tara says asking repeat. asking us to repeat something, but I don't know. I what. think it's about Judy Wicks. Okay. Yeah, so, the organization is called All Together Now PA. Um, you can look them up online. They're on uh, Facebook and they've got a, um, a web page. But we'll also have an interview coming up in probably a month or so with Judy. Uh, so keep an eye on Sustainability Now, our, our social and our website for, um, for more info on her. Yeah at least over the next couple of months for sure. Mm -hmm. So next up, here's a, a bit of a diagram talking about this, the circular economy. And this came from the, um, the Netherlands, the, the government and environmental assessment agency. So um, they're, they're actually embracing it really well over there. I'm, I'm really in, encouraged to see what they're doing and can't wait to see how well it works. They've um, adopted this as their comeback plan for COVID. Rather than trying to get back to normal, they're tr trying to talk about what normal ought to look like. But the idea here is, you know, if you start in the upper left, um, you know, you want to use renewable energy wherever possible. And um, of course, you're going to need some natural capital to get the process started. But the, uh, you can see that arrow is a lot thinner than the other ones because that's um, as you get more and more into a circular economy, you'll need less and less of that. And what and we're calling you, natural capital is air, water, uh, lumber, uh, any kind of natural resources. Yep. Um, minerals, whatever it is that you're making your products from. Yep. But the idea is, um, you know, now you're in production, you want to design and um, like we talked about earlier, design the waste out of the process so that you're making the most out of every one, every bit of that natural capital that you're putting in and also designing in new revenue models. There's a, um, a whole proposal as part of Circular is that you're buying a service rather than a product. And that will work to, um, to overcome the whole uh, planned obsolescence if you're buying, let's say cell phone for instance, you're buying cell service and the device is the delivery mechanism but you don't actually own that. So then the manufacturer has a vested interest in it not burning out after two years and forcing you to buy a new one because they're not making money off of that second sale anymore. They're making money off of a, a monthly subscription. So the longer it lasts, the better their profit margin is. Beautiful, that's brilliant. And then uh, the collaboration of supply chain, you know, it's, it's getting the manufacturers closer together like we talked about with the All Together Now model and uh, finding ways that people can work more hand in hand with each other instead of uh, just you know, calling up and asking for more raw materials to make my XYZ product you know, from the raw materials people. How do we work together to, to refine that process and make it more efficient? And you can see the, the recycling loop begins at the end of production because a lot of what gets recycled uh, isn't true post-consumer waste, it's industrial waste. It's things that would have been thrown out in a, in a normal uh, linear model, get pumped back into making other things out of them or into the process that they started in to make sure that we get the most out of all the different materials we're bringing in. And that's actually something that is, is invisible to most of us as consumers is the amount of waste that occurs in the production of the th materials that we use and the products that we use, it is absolutely staggering. So to be able to repurpose that waste into the production cycle is absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, even little things like how you open bags to make sure you get all of the product out of them. You know, one of our um, interviews last summer was with an um, industrial consultant who helps people find new models for their waste stream. And what he noticed was the way that people were cutting the bags open and tossing the empty bags still had a lot of um, material left in them. So when they started slicing in the other direction, they could get the material out of them easier and they weren't wasting the resources that they just paid to have trucked into the facility. It can be so simple to make <laughs> such a big difference. It's extraordinary. Yep. And uh, 
We are a little over, we're about 40 minutes into our hour here, so I want to keep things moving. And uh, next up, we actually have um, the slide deck that Sean has provided to talk about his organization and what they're doing, which is totally astounding to me. The, the vision that Sean has put together and what they've got going on, I think, is um, it's an inspiration to us all. And I'll, I'll let it's you take world, it, it. It's world changing, literally, without exaggeration. I'm sure you'll agree. <clears throat> as you see it. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much. Um, I'm, I'm enjoying the, the discussion, actually. So this is very good. And I feel a bit guilty about this because this is a, um, a product, but it is a product that um, offers solutions. So I think ultimately I'd rather refuse, but uh, we do have problems to address. And, uh, and this is a solution to quite a few of our, our major problems uh, in the world. Um, so, yep. Um, the problems we're solving, we have a potential here with, as we scale this, this up and our and, and new way of thinking to address our major issues, climate change, deforestation, pollution, and poverty. Uh, they can all be traced uh, to the same cause and effect, really. So um, this is where our solution is headed. Um, circular economy, uh, the palm oil industry is, um, has a bad reputation. There's many factors to um, to this, uh, but it certainly can't be disguised that um, there's been terrible performance in the past. Um, the real issue here is burning of land mass and burning of the biomass. So in industry, when you are producing materials, um, probably the most negative effect is in the process not maximizing a resource so the amount of energy uh, and pollution generated in manufacture um, is is really the at the front end uh, where the damage is done so the negative of the palm industry is that it's producing a huge amount of co2 uh, per day greater than the entire european union combined our solution looks at ways that we can completely eliminate this um, one through um, stopping land clearance um, which in many areas of the industry has already stopped but there are different islands of different some countries that are still clearing at a fast rate which is completely unnecessary uh, and unwarranted um, and then the large cause of um, emission is actually burning the biomass in the process which is, is unnecessary so we're looking at a solution for this. Uh, we've picked a, a country where we think we can be a leader uh, and then have the rest of the industry um, follow through. Um, by adding new solutions, we can address the issue around deforestation um, and eliminating this. Um, and we can maximise the byproducts, which in one way we're talking about the palm industry here uh, and our innovation, but uh, the thought behind what we are doing could really be picked up across all forms of industrial uh, production. Um, yep. uh, next one, Scott. Okay, so the, the problem with the perception of palm right now is there's a push to ban it. Um, the reality of doing such is that there's 58 million people between Indonesia and Malaysia that rely on the industry for direct and indirect employment um, without having new regulations in place or a plan the problem that will occur is this industry has been rolled out incredibly fast for huge land clearance and it's created a giant monoculture now you can't just turn off the tap when that's the position that you put you know some of the largest nations in the world into. Um, what we need to be doing is creating solutions to this industry, diversifying uh, from the monoculture, introducing reforestation programs, um, diverse agriculture, other means uh, for employment, uh, other means for recreation, um, and transitioning away. So we're looking at a solution that um, is a long-term a realistic solution rather than uh, decimation by um, completely um, changing it um, in one foul swoop of a pen, which um, bans and regulations would occur. So currently, the 
process with palm is that you harvest the fruit of palm. Um, it's actually a fantastic crop. Uh, it fruits three times a year. Uh, it's the largest provider of ed edible oils in the world, uh, which is not um, really a sustainable issue. It's driven by fast food, but the commodity is there and the production occurs and it produces fuel from, from fruit. So there's pros and cons to that. Um, one being it's not a petrochemical um, product um, uh, and a lot of the negative stigma around it is being driven actually by the um, petroleum industry uh, looking at palm as a threat. When we look at the refining of the palm, uh, the process as it currently stands is the fruit is taken to um, small scale crude refineries and large scale industrial refineries. They produce edible oils and they produce biodiesel. These aren't really, certainly the biodiesel isn't an economically viable um, commodity. It's propped up heavily with subsidies. So it's very volatile to um, an industry that could collapse, uh, which again, when we have monocultures in place, uh, is, is a huge threat um, to us globally um, um, as, a, as a social and environmental impact. Um, we generate a fuel and then there's some very undervalued byproducts that come from the other side. So the byproducts that we're looking at are, are glycerin. Um, it's sold primarily uh, into very cheap manufacturing streams. It goes into plastics. Uh, it also goes into sort of chemical production um, from very cheap uh, mass produced chemicals to some exotic expensive chemicals. Uh, but without doubt, the glycerin is low value, um, produced in huge volume and, and um, yeah, really perceived as a byproduct as it currently stands. And the interesting one with the palm is by extracting the oils, uh, we're left with a large biomass of organic fiber, which could be a terrific commodity, but in effect, what is currently done in production is that is burnt. Um, so it's burnt for a very ineffective form of energy, which is put back into um, the refinery process. Uh, a lot is burnt just to remove the waste and that really is the cause of the carbon emissions which are just staggering. So um, in their peak season through Indonesia and Malaysia, burning um, of the biomass um, and burning of the land for land clearance is contributing to 11.3 million tonnes per day of carbon emissions, which in comparison, the entire European Union produces um, 8 million tonnes a day. So if we have a solution to eliminate this burn, then we have this giant um, positive impact that can be made on the earth. Um, and we're looking at that by actually treating as should be the organic fibre as a commodity in itself. Beautiful. Yep. So our proposed circular economy model, what we are doing here is taking a sustainable palm oil source. So it's important that we only work with ethical producers um, that are adhering to all codes um, that they've assigned to under the WWF's roundtable for sustainable palm oil. We have the existing process where refined biodiesel producers a finished uh, product um, being the biodiesel or edible oils. Byproduct glycerin and organic fibre are our current byproducts. Uh, what I've actually failed to introduce is our innovation and how we started with this was a uplift of the glycerin. So what we have um, created is a bio epoxy resin from glycerin. Um, we did this as a solution to a problem for a client that had a surplus water issue and we decided to produce our own biodiesel from algae. Uh, in doing these trials, we were facing regulations which were treating the glycerin as a waste product, which the client would be fined for. So we had to do an uplift um, and actually find a solution for the glycerin, not just dump it as a, as a low-valued commodity or effectively a waste stream. So we've created a non-toxic, non-carcinogenic epoxide from the glycerin, which is unique to other epoxies in the world, which are petrochemical products. Uh, our, glyc uh, our epoxy is a odorless, UV stable, hard, clear uh, industrial product uh, that we can make um, with a patented process of conversion of the glycerin to an epoxide. So this is introducing a great product to the world. 
which at the same time is displacing an incredibly toxic product, but in a developed world, a essential product. Almost everything that we use in day-to-day -day items um, has epoxies in it. So generally, unless you're hands-on making materials, working in a trade, uh, you're not in contact with epoxies, um, but a huge portion of the global workforce is, uh, and it's affecting their health to work with that. But as a consumer, we are all surrounded by it, a bit like, um, I guess, the analogy of being in one way anti-mining, but driving a car that's made of um, you know, steel and other um, rare earths and minerals and copper wire and everything that it would like to not think about, we are inadvertently all consuming these products as it's effectively a glue, a binding agent, and it appears in you know, most items in our daily life. Um, but we can replace it uh, with a sustainable um, organic uh, alternative, which uh, is a step in the right direction. Now, the big opportunity here and the I guess the, the light bulb moment that we had with how we could actually bring a positive to the biodiesel industry. Um, I should mention that we could do this on you know, any continent outside Antarctica because there is biodiesel industries um, throughout the world. But we were, being an Australian company, close to Southeast Asia with great research partnerships with um, institutions in Malaysia and Indonesia. Uh, and a love of those uh, nations and an opportunity to see that this huge reliance on palm oil was in one way an asset to the countries. It's also uh, an environmental disaster in its current practice and it is a huge threat to the people of these countries as well if the, um, if the industry vanishes without um, a sustained um, exit plan. So what we can do with the biomass um, is actually dry um, the fibre and then we effectively take that as a sawdust, or as you know, a better than a, for, um, a sawdust, an organic long grain fibre. And we can use a low portion of our resin, which works incredibly well as a binding agent, um, so roughly 3% by weight, bio epoxy plus the biomass, and together they create a particle board. So we effectively have an alternative to medium density fibre board where we take one situation that we're looking at and then you can skew that to other parts of the world that are huge producers of a terrible product being medium density fiberboard which um, is a drain on agroforestry and, and illegal forestry um, as a low cost material um, bound by formaldehyde which is an unbelievably toxic product which is fair to say could be considered as a new asbestos as awareness to these products come. So with formaldehyde, we have no end of life. We have a product that um, can be in your house and it can be safe uh, once installed, but once you de demolish um, and look to reuse, you still activate the formaldehydes. The formaldehydes are uh, forever toxic um, and they're a dreadful product. Um, so, so Sean, the, like this, this is phenomenal. Like everybody watching this and, and seeing this loop, you can see how, Sean is not only creating a new industry that and and solving a problem from an industry that's highly highly toxic but he's also sustaining a culture and so I, I'm wondering if maybe we can go through the the slides to show the application pretty quickly so we can leave a few minutes at least for people to ask questions because we've got like eight minutes I think okay so here we go here's um I'll just okay, so, real quick if you give a sentence or two about each of them, Sean. Yeah, sure. So looking at the industries that we can go into, um, the surf um, um, and winter sports markets, uh, it's all made from glass and boards. That's epoxy. Um, critically, we've got um, a great place to launch our business with um, a, uh, a clientele that um, are very environmentally conscious. Uh, and one of the key points of why we love the surf industry is surfers respect the surfboard shapers and they are making a sacrifice in um, huge health impacts of working with resins. So this is where we wanted to, to start out in the surf industry. Uh, and by chance, we're actually making very high performance boards. This is um, materials that we're doing in Indonesia where we're one, replacing the concrete foundations using our resin with sand and aggregate. So we have a huge um, impact here uh, for what we can be doing with this construction. And this roofing material 
is actually out of Bali, Indonesia, using used bed sheets. Now we have a beautiful um, anti-fouling, clean, waterproof material, which is just painting the epoxy with, uh, or painting the bed sheet with epoxy uh, and sewing that onto our bamboo frame. So we have sustainable, uh, low impact form of housing um, and big application for developing notions of low cost housing. Uh, resin arts are a good one because um, traditionally epoxides are only used by specialist artists that are well trained for it. Our resin is easier to work with. Um, also because it's odourless and a genuine odour, odourless as far as non-carcinogenic, not just low smell. Um, you can work in shared spaces, so we can actually start introducing residents to um, younger children, schools, colleges, um, and, and there's a lot of resin art um, sort of opportunities to be done. Flooring's how we started. Uh, this is one of our first floors that we ever did. That's a large market. We have industrial sort of properties to our floors and it's four times harder than concrete. Uh, and really good, this is um, in the Australian sun with no real protection and it hasn't yellowed. So general petrochemical epoxy is yellowed about two years uh, and we have a clear product here. So it's nice high performance, uh, great results with the resin made from, from palm waste. And the, the MDF board um, was a big application here because the feed source of what is available is ginormous. And then if you look at all other forms of industry uh, with waste streams, with byproducts, sawdust and other materials, it's very easy to find a fibre. You don't need to cut down trees to find new fibre. Uh, and then you bind it together with something better than formaldehyde and you have soft construction materials. So interior walls, so forth, packaging, can all be made with byproducts, not um, finite resources and new commodities. So this is our um, opportunity to do something really positive with the biomass while at the same time eliminating burning it and generating huge carbon emissions. I'm wondering if we can skip ahead to how to reach Sean so that we have five minutes for questions. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. sure. There are a couple of other examples along the way here, but we'll skip ahead. This is Sean's contact information if anybody would like to catch, catch a hold of him after we're done here. And we'll also post this a recording of this and uh, links to everything up on uh, sustainabilitynow.global, our website, and um, on our social media feeds as well. And Sean, thank you so much for being here with us. You are, it, it's remarkable to me that one person with a vision can impact cultures and impact the world in such a profound degree. It's extraordinary. So does anybody have any questions? You can unmute Maybe. yourself and uh, ask out loud or type it in the chat. Nobody? Mm -hmm. Well, I have a quick question for you, Sean, which is yeah. how did, like, did you, oh, here we go. Has Sean been in touch with Hazel Henderson, Ethical Markets? Hazel was one of our speakers at a, um, at a summit that Scott and I produced, and Sean was as well. So if you want, uh, you're actually going to get introduced to Hazel because she's going to be on the, um, uh, on the Eco Park Committee. But she's a good contact. That's a great suggestion, June. Thank you for that. Thanks. Hazel's an amazing lady. So my question was, this... The scope of this, your vision is so huge. How did you generate it? But before you answer that question, it looks like Tara unmuted. So Tara, do you have a question? Uh, just can you give a quick uh, rundown of your uh, manufacturing process? I kind of missed it, you know, just a quick how, how you produce it. Real quick. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Tara. Um, so it's, it was, it was, designed to solve a solution uh, and what we do is we use a we use an acid plant um, so we reticulate acid in a refining process so there's very little waste uh, almost zero waste in the production process but it is conversion to change the molecular structure of the glycerin to activate it as an epoxide which creates a product that works as a traditional two-part epoxy so we then have an activated hardener we use an amine, an ammonia-based hardener now, um, and then we can join those two together um, to create a chemical reaction that has a 44-minute pot life and creates the premium uh, epoxide. 
We're also in development with our um, chemists in the lab on bio-based hardeners. Um, we've actually created a complete bio solution where we've gone to an organic plant-based hardener, uh, which was something that we were you know, always striving for. Um, we haven't commercialized that yet, but we are trialing it and it's working very well um, as a casting resin. So the, the dream is to go 100% bio, but the unique part of the product and how we do this refining conversion is the part A resin we've completely gone about a different way than traditional petrochemical epoxides. And it is um, patented and a relatively straightforward conversion of the glycerin. So we're producing in Australia at the moment. Um, we have a toll chemical manufacturing facility that we use. Um, it's cost prohibitive to do this in Australia because it's a bulk commodity and in industry. I am yep. so sorry, but I need to cut you short because right. we have one Keep minute, going. if that, and yeah. we, we have to end this. But please go see our interview with Sean at sustainabilitynow.global, and you can reach him through this contact information. We'll be posting this conversation and presentation, and I just want to say thank you to everyone who joined us here. This was such a treat. has been great. Thanks, everybody. And Thank we you. have to wrap it up because this common Zoom room is used for all of the presentations coming up. So in one minute, uh, it's about to be uh -huh. another presentation. Yep. So we've got <laughs> to end it. Thank you so much. No worries. Thanks very much for having us, guys. Bye, guys. Bye, everybody. Thanks again.